Welcome to the Free Library of Philadelphia. Uh, my name is Jason Freeman, and I work in the Author Events Office here. And I'm really, really excited to be here to introduce classicist composer Philip Glass, one of the most influential artists of any stripe in the last 50 years, maybe more. Uh, describing himself as working in, quote, music with repetitive structures. Glass's impressive and immersive work includes more than 20 operas, 10 symphonies, feature film and documentary scores, musical theater works, uh, several concertos, chamber music, compositions, and I even discovered amidst writing this, a bit of work for Sesame Street. Uh, he is the subject of no less than six documentary films, has collaborated with artists across a wide spectrum, spectrum of genres, and has been nominated for and won multiple Golden Globe, Oscar, and BAFTA awards. Glass's new memoir, Words Without Music, depicts the stories behind his most famous music, his beginnings in Baltimore, his travels around the world, and the relationships, personal and professional, that have influenced him most. Intervu interviewing Mr. Glass tonight uh, is composer Kyle Smith, classical host at Philadelphia's WRTI-FM, a contributing editor at the Broad Street Review, and former curator right here of the Fleischer Collection at the Free Library of Philadelphia. Uh, so, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, won't you please join me in welcoming Philip Glass and Kyle Smith. So, with uh, Philip, with 10 symphonies, 25 operas, that can't possibly be true, but it is. 26, actually. It's 26 <laughs> since, well, I finished the book yesterday, so it's 26 since then. 11 concertos, five or six string quartets, I think. Um, 30 film soundtracks. You can stop that business, it's okay. <laughs> we, we get the idea. So this was, is just all leading up to, are you the hardest working man in show business? Uh, well, <laughs> I call writing music a nervous habit. A nervous <laughs> habit. Okay. I just do a lot. But you know, the fact is, is that I, I, uh, it's what I really like doing, and I do. A, uh, I just do what I'd like to do, yeah. and that's. It's become even more true as I get older. The uh, a day of, a whole day of writing music, is a real feels like a real good day to me. Uh, early on, Ornette Coleman told you that there's a difference between the music world and the music business. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that not once, but a couple of times in the book, so it must be an important... Uh, well, I'm still pondering that, <laughs> and I'm not sure that... I think I probably knew a little bit more about it than he did, because I, I was more in the music business than he was. Yeah. I grew up in it because of my dad. He had a, a record in repairs. Well, I was going to ask, I mean, how much of that... Uh, do you think th that it's affected your career comes oh, from sure. what Ornette Coleman told you? And is that locked no. in with what you learned from your dad? With well, because of one thing, I was a record bar for the store when I was 15. Mm -hmm. And we didn't, he was not an educated as a musician at all. Uh, but uh, he never told me which was the good music and not so good music in the store. Mm -hmm. It was just music. Right. And I, I uh, and uh, actually there are a lot of... Uh, that's much more true of American composers than the European composers. We tend to be interested in all kinds of music. The Europeans tend to be categorized it much more. Is that so? Yes, it's true. Uh, so then, uh, 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 I liked all kinds of music. And, and, and what I began doing at a certain point, I began playing with other musicians. Yeah. First, so people who were in the pop world or the jazz world, but then also people who were not uh, from North America, uh, people from Australia or Africa, or China. Mm -hmm. uh, some of the most interesting uh, projects for me have been those collaborations with other composers, which is kind of an unusual thing. But I found, I found it almost one of the most uh, stimulating things that I could do. Well, the, 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 one of the biggest names that comes out in your book is Ravi Shankar. Well, he was like a teacher. I, I, was, I and, worked for him, but he was And really you worked with him, and you said he's, he's the composer-performer par excellence. He's, he's the guy. Yeah. And you started writing film music with uh, 
un under under uh, well, he was a project uh, with him, right? That's right. Mm -hmm. I actually did a little bit of music for that. What did school. you learn about film uh, film music with Ravi Shankar? Well, that was the first. I had been working. I was in Paris uh, studying with a, a great teacher, but, uh, but uh, the Fulbright, it, there was really not quite enough money to live on. So I was always looking for work, and I started doing work. Uh, there was a lot of work in the film business in, in Paris, mm -hmm. but I was working in the, dublage, uh, the, the dubbing part of the business. You would, you would go in and you would dub? No, I wasn't particularly good at, the, I wasn't a good actor, though I, d I did a little bit of that. But I, I got, when I got a job, it was really one line like the elevator operator said, going up. I, that I could do. <laughs> uh, but I, they, but what, what I, I started uh, helping to write the, the film yeah. script. But what I learned, I learned a lot about how, the, uh, how you place the sounds on the lips. Which so that later, when I was much later, I was working on, a, on film, writing film music for films that had been made already, like the Cocteau films, mm -hmm. like uh, that comes much La Belle later. Yeah. and then La Belle La Belle was like that. And then I put the, I was able, I, I, that kind of practice that I had as a young well, guy. That, that, that was a fascinating, and, and I don't know if this has ever been done before, where you actually took the film with the actors talking and you matched the music to their speech. Yes. But you turned the sound down on the film, and it was your music. I, we, uh, I added, I, I, turned the op I turned the film into an opera. Right. And I thought it was such a good idea. I thought other people would do it, and I would do it, but no one else did it. <laughs> and, and then I just never did it again either. But I, uh, uh, but, uh, I thought it was what was really interesting about it, Carl, was that uh, uh, the by putting the live singer, I, I began to perform this live, so the singers, the, the film would be there. The singers were underneath the film, and my ensemble was playing in front of them, the audience was out there. But uh, what happened was that uh, the film became a real performance then. The, I would say that the liveness of the playing was borrowed by the film, right. and instead of being a, 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 a instead of being just a mechanical reproduction of a score, it became an actual performance. And it meant that the performers on the screen were performing too. So that we, so what was interesting about it, and I hadn't anticipated that, I didn't know that was gonna happen. I just did it because uh, I wanted, I was experimenting with the idea, by that time I'd been, had done some film music, and what I discovered, which every, we all discover, is that, the, that there is a formula for writing film music which is completely annoying which is that you come in at the end and you write all the music. Composer's in. always the last one. Last one. Right. And what's annoying about this is that, that the, uh, uh, the, the filmmakers rarely understand what the function of the, film, of the music is. Right. So that, uh, though on a few occasions, was, I was able to work on documentary films with people who allowed me to work with them as part of the process of making the film. Like with the films by Gaffer Reggio, the, the Katsi films. Well, this is what's fascinating because you, you came into film music, and then when you started writing film music, you said, this is how I want to do it, and for some reason they said yes. I mean, even, well, Mar not, even Martin say Scorsese. No, 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 they didn't say <laughs> Only two people said yes, and, uh, and I, I did a lot more than two films. But uh, uh, I got Scorsese to say yes, yeah. and when I did the score for Kundun, I was writing the music before he filmed it. I was already using the, the scenario. And it's not hard to do. Uh, you know, a scenario of a film could be 100 pages. A film might be 100 minutes. So it's roughly speaking a minute a page. It's, very not, it's not hard to figure out how to do that. And then you just have to make it longer or shorter according to how it may come out. But it won't be that, that but they were having, I mean, You were having Martin Scorsese sending you the, uh, what they filmed that day. No, they no. They would edit it and come later. The other way, later, it, the other way wrong. It. I sent yeah. him the music that he was filming <laughs> that day. And, 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 uh, uh, Thelma Schumacher was with them right, his uh, editor. on, uh, they were out shooting mostly, actually they, they filmed that in Morocco. The, I'm talking about Kundin, the film about the Dalai Lama. Mm -hmm. they, they'd filmed it in Morocco and then they sent a second unit to the Himalayas to, to do the mountains and then they put it together. Uh -huh. it, it looks pretty good. <laughs> you know, it looks kind of like you, you think you might be in Tibet, but you would never think you're in Morocco in any case. But he was there with a, uh, a the whole company were Tibetans, 
there was uh, M1 Chinese uh, who played the part of the general. Uh, if yeah. you know that film. Yeah. But if you don't know, you, it's, it's a, a remarkable film in many ways uh, because of the way um, what Marty was trying to do but by, by showing what that world was like and what he succeeded in doing. Okay, I want to bring up a word to get rid of it. And the word is minimalism. Okay, you got rid of it. <laughs> <laughs> Can we move what, on now? Yeah, because <laughs> what you've said over the years, and you said in your book, I'm not a minimalist composer. I'm, and you said this is very interesting. I hadn't heard this before. You said, I'm a theater composer. I write for the theater. Well, that has the virtue that of context. being actually what I do. <laughs> <laughs> of being the truth. So that's a good answer. Yeah, well, um, if, you, if you consider that, f that theater would include film, mm -hmm. uh, dance, sure. uh, uh, um, and opera, almost anything where a collaboration, where the elements of text, image, uh, music, and movement, yeah. wherever those four elements come in, you're dealing with theater. So define minimalism for us and well, what your music Why should I do that? Is. It was never my idea to begin well, with. Well, that's a good answer. <laughs> uh, and, uh, uh, there was a, the guy who, the, the two people who contend that they invented it, one was a guy named Tom Johnson, who was yeah. a composer, is a composer, yeah. who wrote actually a three-note opera. Now, now that's, he was a minimalist. That's and minimalism. He was, and he, he, invent, he, he, he was running for, I think, the Village Voice many years ago, and he, he, was, he coined that word. But actually, it was borrowed from a movement in the art world of minimalists, which would be Donald Judd and, and Saul LeWitt and, uh, um, uh, let's see, Robert. Uh, I said there were a couple of, there were a couple of people that, that were working, yeah. and, and they were called minimalists. And we knew them. There was a relationship in terms of structure, and I think Tom took that word and just used it, and then it became, uh, it became. I don't, I don't have to tell you. It became easier for uh, for editors of magazines and papers to use the word right, right. because it seemed to say something. But actually, the problem was it, it, it didn't say anything. It said the wrong thing. Well, you say something uh, really uh, transparently. Um, it, it's a revelation because you say. Who would listen to just repetitive music? Because the, what's the, what's what we listen for are the changes. That's right. In the repetition, and that's uh, and it's not even that you have to develop a new way of hearing, because we hear that way all the time anyway. And that's what you I'm I'm guessing from what you said in the book. That's what you're trying to do in your music. Well, there's another angle to this too. If you really want to have a serious talk about this, I guess we have to do it. Um, uh, <laughs> What, let's talk about the painters and the sculptors who were minimalists. What they were doing was they were removing the, uh, the image, the narrative image from the, from the painting. Right. Uh, and there are several, there are different ways of being abstract. Uh, there, you can be abstract the way uh, Jackson Pollock was abstract, or you could be abstract the way Frank Stella was abstract. Mm -hmm. They're completely different ways. But what they both managed to do is to remove the image of uh, the still life or the, uh, you know, it's really interesting because Bob Wilson, who I work with, he often talked about the, he did talk about images, but um, uh, he talked about the mid-range, the far images, and the close image of portraits and uh, th that kind of thing. But uh, what they were doing actually was removing the, uh, the, the, the subject or the narrative from it. And that was also done uh, by writers. Mm -hmm. It was done by Samuel Beckett, it was done by uh, Brian Geisens, uh, it was done by, uh, 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 and the, the idea then was to find a, a way of telling a story which was not uh, following the, let's say, the classical way of telling a story would be the way that Aristotle described it, mm -hmm. where you would have a hero and there would be a tragic flaw and then after the, the flaw, would then there would be the fall, uh, the fall of the hero. That's the, tra the theory of tragedy was that. Right. It came from, it goes all the way back to the Greeks. That's why we like the Greeks, by the way. Uh, or if we, if we do like the Greeks. Because the hero, uh, because but, the heroes fall well, because the, there's a story. Well, the, that, that became the model yeah. of, a, of, a narrative, uh, of a narrative story. Uh, and it really took a long time before people began to get the idea that maybe a story could be told without, the st without that story. So, th so the, the idea then became uh, to have a different kind of structure. And what they were, what the, the 
sculptors and painters were doing, they were, uh, instead of content, they used structure. Mm -hmm. And then an interesting thing happened, because by doing it that way, uh, the form and content became identical, which turned out to be a very modern idea. Uh, so the, the real thrust of minimalism had to do with that. The, the, what we were, I, I would say that my generation of people were doing, we, uh, we were responding to something quite different. We were responding to a, a form of modernism in music, which we didn't, uh, which we admired, which I particularly admired, but which I had no interest in perpetuating or having anything to do with. Uh, yeah, so you, when you're saying modernism, you're talking about well, European... Well, we're talking about people that lived 100 years ago. I mean, that's mm -hmm. how music, unfortunately, is very retarded that way. We still think of Schoenberg as a modern composer. Right. He, right. That's 103 years ago. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's really a long time ago. Now, you said that about Samuel Beckett. And of course, you worked on his, uh, on, on his plays. It, you said that he swept the table clear of that's modernism, right. swept the cobwebs away. Have you done that with music? I don't know if they put more cobwebs in, maybe. <laughs> I'm not sure I did that. Uh, but, but, but however, and that you mentioned, working with him, I did, uh, I did about eight scores for his plays. Right. And when I, this was when I was beginning uh, my minimalist period. Is that what you <laughs> uh, and and <laughs> you, 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 your ideas are prevailing in some warped way. Right? But, but at any rate, but the thing... Uh, when, when I uh, it was through working with... We're talking, you're, you're in Paris, it's the mid-60s, right? Yeah, yeah. so mid-60s, and I'm working, and the company I'm with, we are working with Beckett. And uh, mm -hmm. he likes us, we were young, he didn't particularly want to spend any time with us, but we, uh, he advised us about, he, he allowed us to do his, his work, mm -hmm. and he uh, advised me about the music from time to time. So we had some a real contact in that way. And what I, one of the things that he did was really interesting. He uh, did a, a piece called La Comédie, the play, mm -hmm. and basically it's a cut up. He took a, a story and cut it up and put it back together. Now that's a trick that uh, John Cage did mm -hmm. with his uh, Thoreau piece. Have you ever heard that? I haven't. I heard him read it, it was unbearable. <laughs> well, I heard the... the uh, uh, but I loved it. The LP. <laughs> The LP with all his... Let me tell you what it was. He's he, reading all his stories he, in the he, he one minute long. He took a page of Thoreau, right. and he took the words out of it, and he took the words, and he cut them in, in the words apart until they were just syllables. Right. And he put it back together again, and he read it. Yeah. Well, he sounded like he, you, it was impossible to hear, understand anything. I was in, I went to hear this at a place called The Kitchen. It must have been 1971 or 72, and uh, he emptied the room in about 15 minutes. <laughs> Uh, I, I stayed. I, I stayed, and a friend, a Dutch friend of mine, we stayed to the end, and we just stayed to see what, what would happen, you know. <laughs> and he just kept reading this thing, and it took a long time. Uh, but, but so, so one of the, but this is an interesting idea, the idea of getting rid of the narrative by taking the narrative and, and actually cutting it up and putting it back together, which is what Beckett did. So you force the narrative to be of no account as a narrative, well, and then you force the audience to finish the story, if I can put it that way, or to make the story for the to create. Well, to create it, it, what it does is it, it requires the the uh, spectator mm -hmm. to look at it in a different yeah. way. Uh, uh, and and uh, and what I had to do was find the music to go with it. And the earliest pieces were the pieces for Beckett. Right. And then what happened, I, I would take the music after we had done it with the play, and I would take it home and listen to it. And I, I found I was very interested in the music, yeah. and, and that became the basis of the concert music that I was writing. You became friends with John Cage later on, and, and he said to you That's an exaggeration, time. but we knew each other quite well. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> he said to you, he, he played a piece for him, and he said to you, you write too many notes. No, and, no, he didn't then, say that. He said, no, then, he didn't even say that. He would say, Philip, too many notes. <laughs> <laughs> I, do, you, well, and, do you remember what you said to him? I said, John, I'm one of your children whether you like it or not. <laughs> I'm one of your children whether you like it or not. That's right. <laughs> and he would just shake his head. But <laughs> he, liked the, he liked one piece of mine, uh, Satyagraha, 
not for about Gandhi, mm -hmm. and he saw it several times. And uh, Morton Feldman liked that piece too. Those guys, they didn't, uh, and they, they kind of, they liked me. I mean, I'm, I'm a likable person. I, I wasn't <laughs> mad at them, they weren't mad at me. I was very interested in them and I read, I knew what they did. Yeah. I just didn't want to sound like them. Right. For, I think Morty didn't care whether I sounded like him or not, but John liked people to sound like him. Oh, did he? Oh, yes. Okay. Look at the people he worked with. Okay. Right? Yeah. That's what, he, there was a, it was almost like an Ecole de, de John Cage, the, the mm -hmm. school of John Cage. Mm -hmm. That was, you know, David Tudor, and David Berman, a, a lot of very, uh, it could be beautiful music, mm -hmm. but there was definitely a stylistic similarity. Mm -hmm. A Christian Wolf, same thing. Mm -hmm. Uh, uh, he uh, and uh, what, what he heard about, and it, it, what he didn't really, he couldn't figure out where I came from and where I was going. But we got along well, well enough. And one time he wanted, we ha we we met fairly often. And one time he wanted to talk about opera because he had a commission to do an opera. And and we were supposed to have a, a lunch together and talk about opera, and we never did. And I real I understood from that that he actually didn't want to talk about the opera. But maybe he wanted to, maybe I didn't tell him what he needed to hear. But the subject never came up. And he never wrote the opera? He did. Oh, he, he did. did write the opera. He did write the opera. Yeah. He wrote it for the Frankfurt Opera. Was it Satyagraha or Akhenaten when the Cuddy Sark ad came out? When what? The Cuddy Sark ad came out. Oh, that was for Akhenaten because I, the yeah. Cuddy Sark ad paid for the music preparation. The so. Yeah. So uh, the uh, the print ad in all these uh, upscale magazines, Cuddy Sark has you holding a glass of whiskey with like notes coming out of it, no, and, I and you took you took a lot of heat <laughs> from uh, from that from from, I didn't, from people who thought you were selling out. I, right? I didn't. I thought I was selling in actually. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I I took the money and put it into the work. Right. But because uh, at the time I never, they, were, I, I, they commissioned I, I, you for the piece, but I, you had I, to. I didn't take any heat. I didn't care. I, I, thought, I mean, I, I understood right away that the, the real problem was that, the, that they would like to have done the same thing. Right, right. right. And, and I was the guy that got the, I got the, I got the call. Well, in, in your book, you mentioned that you, me, you mentioned that um, that vignette, and I think you connect that to looking back at when your father had the uh, record store, and you would see people give him five dollars, and he would give them music, and five dollars and music, and it's like. There's music and there's money. There's music and there's money. So it's like I'm not selling out. I'm I'm getting money, and it's because of my music. So what's the problem? And you know, Stravinsky and uh, Rachmaninoff had one very interesting meeting. These are two uh, expatriate Russian mm -hmm. composers. Well, from what I hear about that meeting, was that they were a little, uh, I would say, uh, cool with each other when they first met. But then they began to talk about all the royalties that they had lost because the Russians wouldn't pay them. Right. And they became very good friends. <laughs> Stravinsky no, rewrote, the, look. Stravinsky rewrote when the copyright laws changed, he went and he put new bar lines in all his music so he could re-copyright it as new things. Well, well uh, no, what we, uh, we've done it far easier. Now we've changed the copyright law so we don't have to do that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so now we just extended it. Now it's about 75 years, but it was right. 25 years when he started. So what happened? That's true. He he uh, he republished the pieces, making them slightly different. When uh, you know Peter Shickley, I know him quite well. And he's from around here, by the way. You from Swarthmore. Yeah. And you went to school with him. At the, were you at the uh, Juilliard at the same yeah. time? Yeah, we were. And Juilliard. he wrote a concerto for horn and hard art. And I never knew this before. Maybe other people knew this. I mean, I knew the, you know that what a piece. Do you know about horn and hard art? And so tell them, tell them about the horn. Tell them about the hard art. Well, uh, uh, the hard art. Well, he did a concert every year at the end of the year at Juilliard, and on the concert was a share of horn and hard art. And his brother David and I built the hard art. We built the. He instrument. built the hard art. Uh, well, that didn't exist before until we That's built right. it. That's right. And uh, he had collected a big bag of toys that made different sounds, different yeah. pitches. And David and I put together a big keyboard, but what we didn't tell him was that it was transposing instruments. <laughs> it was a transposing keyboard. <laughs> well, we didn't tell him that. But so, so he came and looked at it and said, oh, this is the, that's the F and that's the C and this and that. And he was writing the piece for the hard art. 
And then when he, we were going to play it, it was in the wrong key. And I, he said, I sounds terrible. I said, but Peter, it's an F. <laughs> he said, oh, my God. And so he, and he found out. Of course, he didn't have any time to practice. He found out just before the concert. Yeah, yeah. And he had to transpose it. Inside. Like it was a French horn player. It was an F. Uh, I think, actually, we did it in A. So we didn't, we didn't pick anything easy. But, uh, so when, when what, uh, then like he wrote, but he got back at you because he wrote a piece after Einstein on the beach came yes, out. Yes, he got his revenge. It took him a little few years. He, he asked me if I would, he was going to do a piece called Einstein on the Fritz. <laughs> and he, he, did a, he did a concert at Carnegie Hall every year for a long time. Right. And he was going to deliver Carnegie Hall, and he said, would I come? And I said, of course I'll come. But what I didn't know, he, he gave me my, my <laughs> ticket. He put me right in the center of the orchestra, and he had a light on me. <laughs> <laughs> For it's Einstein hard, on hard, the Fritz. It's hard to be... <laughs> Peter, when it comes to those kinds of things, <laughs> you can't. Yeah, this is in a cage in a cage match, I suppose, <laughs> with Peter, with Peter Shickley. Um, so I, I, you have you actually have notes? I have I have too many notes. I, I don't have, have any notes. I have <laughs> no. You have you have this. And oh, you, okay. And so, okay. I have not quite as as much as you wrote, but um, so a, a lot of people may not have known that you you went to Juilliard and then you went and studied with Nadia Boulanger in. <coughs> France, and these are two um, two institutions, both of them, of, of uh, corners of American music, uh, which uh, you went in completely different directions. And Nadia Boulanger, who taught Aaron Copland, who taught uh, Virgil Thompson, and, and so many of the American composers, um, and you went in totally different directions. But her her uh, training was was very rigid and and. And, and well, you went, th you went through that, and uh, you came out as Philip Glass, though. Well, when you say the the training, it was, it wasn't so much that it was rigid, but it was. She stayed very close to very fun to the fundamentals. Yeah. And uh, basically, she found just uh, she had devised all kinds of ways of working, so that. Uh, uh, what she was really teaching was she was teaching you how to hear music, mm -hmm. to visualize, to be able to really hear music clearly. Uh, that was the first part of the training. And the second part of the training was uh, she, through very arcane maneuvers of hers, she taught you the difference between style and uh, technique. Mm. That's a good one right there. Mm -hmm. The first one's good, too. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, a good uh, thing. Uh, which one do you want to hear about? <laughs> What's the difference between style and technique? It was towards my end of my studies. Well, I'll tell you this. It, it, it may not be in the book. I, I don't know if I wrote this or not. And I thought, I, I just stopped at, it, it just seemed like big, big <laughs> there's a lot more I could have put in the well, book. Well, see, this is the galley, so there's no index. I can't look it up. So there's no index. <laughs> but it is in the, in the published okay. version. All right. Uh, towards the end, the la I had been with her a number of years, and we had done all the uh, we had done all the counterpoint from starting with first species. We had done all of that. I'd done it. Uh, I redone everything after I'd been at Juilliard, and uh, the Bach chorales and the Prophets of Bach and all that business. Did all that, uh, and I brought. I came in one day with a. Uh, I usually had to bring in about thirty pages a week. She was. This yeah, this was a serious business. Right. And uh, I came in one, one afternoon, and she looked at this uh, piece of uh, this exercise, and she said, the resolution is incorrect. I said, no, Mama, it's, it's correct. She says, no, it's not correct. She said, uh, and I had resolved the soprano in the, uh, the, in the root position in the, in the, on the root of the chord, and she said, it should have, it should, it, you have to resolve it on the third. Mm -hmm. And I said, uh, it's not in the rules that we've been following. And then she did a, a, an amazing thing, and I, I don't know how she figured this out, to do this. She reached behind the, the, the music rack of the piano. She pulled out a, a, a book, and it was, it was the Mozart piano sonatas, it was the Mozart piano violin sonatas, oh, okay. so that you might not know. Okay. I was, you were supposed to know the piano music, but this was a little different. And she picked it up, she opened it, and she pointed to a measure. And it was the same thing. And she said, look what Mozart did. 
and most of it resulted on the third, not the, not the root. And I was speechless. <laughs> and I understood, I immediately understood that she had changed the rules. We were no longer going, talking about technique, we were talking about style. And I understood at that moment that what she was saying, and, and she never said it in, in words, but I, she was, what she was saying basically that a personal style is a special case of technique. And then if you think about if you think about Brahms, or we talk about Rachmaninoff or Stravinsky, within a measure or two you know who wrote what. Mm -hmm. It's because they have selected from the, 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 from the whole category of, tech, of, let's say, harmonic technique, they had developed a predilection for a particular way of resolving right. their of, of voice leading. It's the way Rachmaninoff did it, it's the way Stravinsky did it. Whoever they did it, they had, they had made, they had taken technique the general class of technique, and by selecting their own inclinations, it became uh, the special te the special case of technique became their style. But it's interesting that this came out, uh, well, this the, revelation, when you pushed back, you pushed back a little bit, and then it came out from her. Yeah, <laughs> well, she, uh, yeah I always push back. I, I, I was like, <laughs> but uh, but uh, what, what was interesting about it was that. Uh, the, the, the third part of the, the, the thing that I understood right away was that the reason we were studying technique was so that it would be able to have the ability to, to create a style. Create a style. In other words, without a, a, a solid technical basis, there can't be, there, there won't be, a, there won't be a style. Right. You're just fishing. So, the, so that's that's the relationship of style to technique, mm -hmm. and that was what, that is actually what she taught. She didn't teach composition. As far as I can, she easily didn't teach it with me. She met it up with other people, but she never did it with me. That's what we do. You said that you have a, a certain gene, the I don't care what you think gene. Well, it didn't come when it came to Bullinger. Cool it was a little bit that, different. <laughs> which that may not relate to this as, as much, but how much has that carried you through your career? Oh, it was, it was invaluable. <laughs> uh, because uh, when, I, when I was beginning, after my, my time with the Beckett plays and coming back to New York, and I was writing in a very reductive style, a very reductive way of working. I would do pieces that only had five notes in them and they could go on for 20 minutes. Okay, but not and three notes, five notes. Five notes. <laughs> uh, no, Tom Johnson did the one with three notes. Uh, I needed five. Yeah. He was, he, but he was a real minimalist, I wasn't. That's right, that's, 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 that's a proof right there, you heard it here. <laughs> but, uh, 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 when I, beca when I began performing these pieces, um, I'll, I'll give you a, a story that I think I did write about. I was, uh, I was in Europe, uh, I began touring in Europe very shortly after I came back, and I was going back and playing in different places. And I, I was in Cologne, and I went to the radio station because uh, it was famous for being a place for new music. Stockhausen uh, used to run that place. Mm -hmm. But he had a young fellow about my age, I guess he was about 30 or so, um, and I, I uh, who was looking at music, and I made an appointment. I wanted to show them what I was doing. I thought maybe they play it on the radio. So I, I brought in. I think I probably brought in a piece. Maybe it was Music and Fists or uh, some real, real hardcore, mm -hmm. really <laughs> minimalist. Whatever you call it. You right, you call yeah. it. it was really hardcore. <laughs> and, uh, I, and but we were playing it. It wasn't just I music. We we performed the stuff. Right. Um, and, and I was actually, I wasn't exactly making a living, but I was, I was busily going around with an ensemble playing and paying the people that worked for it. So yeah. the, the music was, was, was taking its place, starting to take its place in the world. And, and I played that and I showed this and he looked at the music. And he looked at it all and he finally said very gently and, and very nicely actually said, have you ever thought about going to music school? <laughs> and I said, uh, I'll give it some thought. <laughs> now, here's the, the, there's another part of the story. I came back about three years later. I was getting a little better known by then. And uh, now I did, was playing, not on the radio, but I was in a, in a big hall. And he came to the concert. But he forgot that, he forgot that we knew each other. And he liked the music a lot. He liked it. I, I, I never told him 
That's the best. That, that, that he had met me before. Uh, keeping silent was the best well, revenge. I've told I you, think. though, and I've told you. <laughs> if you ever run into him, you can tell him. But anyway, so the, the, the idea was that, uh, the, the, the idea when I first came back to New York after my, my Boulanger years and, and my years with, with uh, Ravi Shankar for that matter, the same years. Right. And uh, it was mostly considered that it was a musical idiot. And uh, so, so I didn't, book, yeah. what, what could I say? But you didn't care. Absolutely not. Right. And when I thought it was hilariously funny, actually. Well, the one, I, I, and, and I, I, one event that wasn't funny at the time was you were playing, you were, uh, this is a key to uh, so much of your career is you're performing your music. And you're, yeah, you know, I played it So you're lot. performing your music, you're playing on the piano, and some fellow rushed the stage. Well, this was in Amsterdam, but this was in Europe. And he was, he was banging, as you said, Europe, they have these, you know, these walls. And so, he, and he started what, banging on the piano. Yeah. And what did you do? Well, I knocked him off the stage. <laughs> but uh, it was uh, not much bigger than here. And uh, half the people cheered and half the people booed. <laughs> you know. And I sat down and complained. And then afterwards he came, uh, afterwards he came on and he said, now we have the discussion. And I said, no, 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 we had the discussion. We had the discussion. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to discuss it with him. But then, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the, that was a different matter. The idea that, that, that uh, that I was fooling around, I was there to make fun of him. That's a stupid idea. That's a very stupid. Why would I? Why would I go all the way to Amsterdam and arrange a concert just to make a fool of him? Right. I mean, what a what a what a self-important person that was. Huh? <laughs> so, at any rate, uh, but uh, mainly, uh, oh, uh, we had lots. Of, we we have we had lots of wonderful bad reviews. Uh, I remember one of the Daily News. The title was "Glass Invents, Invents New Sonic Torture." <laughs> <laughs> no, you can't. You can't make that stuff up. Well, with this is a, a substantial book, and of course, of su substantial life. And I have lots of notes, but I brought along about two or three hundred of my closest friends good, good. to ask uh, questions that uh, I have not been able. To good evening, ask. Mr. Glass. Um, I'm curious what you are most excited about in contemporary music right now. What am I excited about in contemporary music? Well, uh, there's a, uh, there are two things that I'm, I'm very interested in. One is uh, uh, the encounters that I've personally made with indigenous composers from Mexico, Australia, Africa. We've talked, you and I talked about this a little bit. Mm -hmm. uh, co collaborations with other composers have been very interesting for me. But the other thing I began hearing very recently, there's a, a generation of composers getting close to 30 or maybe just over 30, uh, who's, uh, I find the music very beautiful and I have no idea what they're doing. It doesn't sound like me, thankfully. I, I wouldn't be, I'm not particularly attracted to minimalism. <laughs> uh, but uh, so, uh, uh, well, I'm, I've heard music by people, it sounds almost like music that you would hear in a dream. It's so, mm. I don't, I can't make heads or tails of what the structure is or what it is, but it's just beautiful to listen to. Is it electronic? Uh, Some of it is. Uh -huh. uh, uh, there, there are people who are finding sounds uh, from uh, kind of cast, cast off parts of, right. of uh, yeah. what, what might have been an electronic studio. Mm -hmm. and making sounds out of that. Mm -hmm. It's not exactly collage, though. Uh, collage is in itself not necessarily, not particular. collage is just putting things together. Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm really hearing th people writing pieces that are almost like dreams. Mm -hmm. It's very abstract. Mm -hmm. But what I like about it is I have no idea what it is. That's a good place to start. And I love to listen to it. Yeah. I, I, I like that. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I would say also that at this point, uh, we're talking about people that are 40 years younger than me. Mm -hmm. And I'm just happy that I'm living long enough to hear some of the new music that's being done. I'm doing what I do. I, I'm continuing on a path that I began. I, I have an agenda that I'm interested in. The, the language of my music evolves, but according to its own it has, terms. Yeah. But uh, I, I don't feel a need to, to go... That has a... a, a 
a development of its own. Uh, what I'm interested in is people who uh, were not interested in that at all and just started someplace else. Mm -hmm. And then you don't know what it is, but I it's beautiful. Know. How much no. do you pay attention to the content in, in your music that's not the musical part of it? I'm, I'm oh, that's that a is. good question. Um, is that actually the question you asked? <laughs> no, it isn't. But can I answer it anyway? Okay. Uh, one of the things that I've done a lot, quite a lot of, and it began when I uh, first came, when I first went to music school, and I asked myself who was wanted the music I was writing. I was about 20. Mm. And I immediately found out that dancers wanted it, uh, filmmakers wanted it, theater people wanted it. And I began writing for dance and for theater and for film almost immediately. I found that, that uh, and because of that, I got involved in interacting with, uh, I talked a little bit before about text, movement, image, music, these four elements. To me, they were like the air, air, earth, fire, and water, the four elements of, let's say, theater. I became very interested in, the, in working in that way. And I ended up writing 10 symphonies. But, but that was because uh, Dennis Russell Davis asked me to do it. I never thought I wanted to. Right. I, I, I wrote it for him. I, when left to myself, I almost always ended up in doing a, mm -hmm. a, a theatrical work mm -hmm. piece. And I, I, what I was interested in uh, was that the encounters that I arranged in these theater works uh, put me uh, in touch with people whom I didn't know. In fact, I, I rarely, I usually, when I did a succession of theater pieces, I almost never worked with the same people again. I would always get new people to work with. Mm -hmm. Because what I liked was um, having to solve a new problem. I liked being in the position where I didn't know what I, what, how to do what I needed to do. Well, your music is... Good evening, Mr. Glass. Uh, I was wondering if you could speak a bit about what inspired you to write two symphonies uh, based on the music of David Bowie, Tony Visconti, and Brian Eno. And uh, if they're unique certainly unique songwriting approach there influenced how you approach that task. <clears throat> I was really thinking about in, in a simpler way. Uh, composers have traditionally, we've always uh, done ba music based on other people, whether it was, uh, it could be Bach, or it could be anybody, uh, Dvorak or Stravinsky. Oh, m most of uh, the f those first three ballets of Stravinsky's, all that music is borrowed. It's borrowed from Russian folk music. Mm -hmm. um, you can, it's, in fact, there's a book of Russian folk music that was edited by Rusty Korsakov that became the basis of all that music. So that, it's very commonly we do that kind of thing. Now, I, I, uh, I liked uh, David's music and I liked Brian's. I, one of the things is that they did music together, but they never told me who did what, and I couldn't find out. Um, uh, I said, uh, if I asked them, they wouldn't tell me. But they would do, but I later did discover that what they did is they, they, share, they would take a studio and Brian would go in and work for three or four hours and he would leave and David would come back and he would work on the same tracks. Mm -hmm. That's how they did it. They never worked actually in the same room at the same time. <laughs> but I thought they were very, very gifted songwriters. And I, uh, they were interested in making some kind of crossover into concert music. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, low, the, low, uh, the music from Low uh, was exactly like that. Um, Do, uh, a Lodger was another one that was like that. Uh, uh, they did three records where, in those days, we had an A side of a record and a B side. Do you remember that? The A side were the pop songs, and the B side was what they hoped would be their concert music. So they kind of started that already. So I decided to take the B-side and to take it seriously. So I took the B-side of the low record and I made a symphony out of it. And David didn't particularly like it, uh, but, uh, but he would play. I found out that he was, I did another record, the fourth symphony, I did it, it again. He liked that one better. And he said, in the, the reason he didn't like the low one very much, he said it sounded too much like him. Whereas in the fourth symphony, he said it sounded more like me. 
But that's the kind of thing I would have said too. You mentioned you have an agenda for your writing for the future. Would you like to share that with us? What's that? An, your, an agenda an for agenda. your writing for the Did future. Did I say that? She looks trustworthy. I, I do. <laughs> I, I, I do have things I want to do, but I didn't thought I, I hadn't revealed it to anybody yet. But uh, uh, there, there's an opera that I, I have yet. I was working with Doris Lessing on operas. We did two. We did The Making of Represent for Planet 8, and we did The Marriages Between Zones 3, 4, and 5 based on books of hers from the Canopus and Argus series of books. Do you know her work, uh, Doris Lessing? Some of you do. Uh, she wrote, an, and uh, I wanted to do a trilogy, and but for the third one, I picked up a, a work, a book uh, called Memoirs of a Survivor. Uh, uh, Doris died before I got to that, but we had talked about it, and uh, and uh, and I told her I wanted to do the third book. Uh, I was going to do the third opera. I didn't know. She she died not so much suddenly, but she was in her 90s. But she didn't look like she was going anywhere, anywhere time too soon. But and I was surprised when she she passed away without very quickly. Uh, and I didn't get a chance to discuss it with her, except that we did talk about it. And uh, and I said, uh, and she said she didn't want to do the adaptation which she had done the first with the first two stories. And I asked her whether Christopher Hampton could be the writer, who was a writer I've worked with. And she knew him. She said, yes, he would be fine. And I said, would you like to see the adaptation before we do the music? And she said, Lord, no. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I'm going to do it. Uh, I, uh, it's, uh, uh, I, uh, I, I, I have a verbal permission from her. Now I have to get it from the estate, which, of course, is always. I think I'll probably get it because I've, I've done the other two. Uh, I have an, a symphony number 11 that Dennis asked for. Is he still asking for symphonies? No. So I've got to do that one. Um, uh, then uh, Brian, Green, uh, Brian, Brian Green wrote a new, a sequel to his uh, Icarus at the Edge of Time story. Here's a, a string theory. String, yeah. Uh, and uh, this is the sequel to that. And he's told me, he's told me this finished, and I'm, I'm to write it this summer. And we we're going to premiere it in November. That's what he told so me. You got your summer, you so got your summer plan. You heard it here first. Is there music always in your mind? Do you sing in the shower? Do you do you think about music as you as you drift off to sleep? Um, I guess I'm, I'm interested in in the creative process. Is do you put music out of your mind when you're not really working on on something that you're planning? Well, why would I do that? <laughs> I I wouldn't think that you do, but I, but I'm just curious if you could I, talk, I talk about to other how musicians you, how about you think this, and what I find that. Many musicians are continually listening to music. Do you do that yourself? It, it, it's, it's like I describe it sometime as an underground river that's there. It's always there. It's always there. If you can, you can tune into it anytime you want to. But that, uh, for people for whom that is a a living, real part of the world. It's, it's a very normal thing. It doesn't seem strange to us at all. And it's very com it's co quite common among musicians, among composers, and among players. Too. Hi. Um, we had dinner like a couple years ago and um, at Chez Panisse in Berkeley after Einstein on the beach. Um, and you told me something that I thought was very uncommon, extraordinary, was that you, when you compose, just write the parts and that that organizes itself, it assembles in your mind. It's actually my question, which I didn't get to ask you then, which is, are you assembling these lines like a sculptor adding the clay? Well, or are you like the sculptor chipping away at the malt marble and it's already there as you compose? Well, I it, thought he was uh, going to ask for uh, another it, dinner. It came about that. <laughs> <laughs> and that, also that. Uh, this practice came about in a different way. I was so uh, I was an assistant for Ravi Shankar when he was working on a score. We sat in a room. Where there was a screen. Uh, he had the sitar there, were ten or twelve musicians there. He looked at the movie and he would say, "Okay, this is the oboe part," and he would play it. I would write the part down and give it to the oboe player. And then he said, "Here's the flute part," and I write the flute part. And we went through until we had done all of it. There was no score, 
And uh, then I had to conduct it, and we recorded it. And now, that was very similar to exercises I had done with Bollinger, so it wasn't that. She had done something, uh, uh, made it even a very fiendish exercise. I, I'll tell you about it because it's so, so weird. But it, we, uh, there was a, Wednesday a Thursday class we called the Black Thursday class. She had six of her students, the six worst ones and the six best ones. But we never knew who was who. <laughs> uh, there was always something we had to solve when we got there. But on this particular day, I'll tell you about what happened. We walked in and there was, on the piano was a, using in tenor clef, there was a line of music. And we looked at it. And she said, uh, Danielle, will you sing the soprano part that goes with that? And we looked at it and he sang a soprano part. And then uh, no one wrote it down. Then she would say, Luis, would you do the tenor part? Now, of course, he had to remember the soprano part. He could see, uh, 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 he could see the part that was already written. Uh, so he added that one. And she said, we had done three of the four. Then she said, well, of course, the fourth one is easy now because you've done the first three. Of course, it's easy if you remember the first two, <laughs> the other two. So, so basically, what, she, what you had to do was and, and the way you learned to do this was by, there was only one way to do it, to learn it. You had to take the Bach chorales and you would learn one line and play the other three. And you had to do that. And we, we were given, I was given one chorale a week, which I had to learn. And when I came in, I had to do it. I had to perform oh, it. Yeah. If she asked me, and she often did not. <laughs> but I dare not be unprepared. I was, it was throwing me out of the house. So uh, by the time I was doing this exercise with Robbie, I said, oh, I know. That's what I used to do with her. So I, I, did, I did the whole score that way. And then I, got, I went back to New York. I was working with my, the guys I played with. And um, I had six players. And I decided, well, why, why should I write a score? First of all, no one asked, wanted to see it. There was no one waiting to see my scores, nor did I send them out to anybody. And you were performing. I was performing it anyway. I had no reason to write the score, so I handed out all the parts. And all of Einstein on the Beach was composed that way. There was never a score to Einstein until uh, some years later, some young f fellow got a, some money from the New York State Council of the Arts to um, uh, to composite, to make a composite of the parts. And, and he, we finally had a score to Einstein, but it was maybe seven or eight years after I composed it. But I didn't do any, I didn't do scores until this character, Dennis Russell Davis, he was, he wanted me to write symphonies. And I, I and then I was writing operas, then I had to do it. Because the guy asking you is the conductor, he wants to have a score well, in front of him. So uh, with Satya Graha, I had to write, Paul, yeah. I had to write a score. I think we have time for one um, more question. I'm a scientist. Um, I am devoid of any artistic capability <laughs> uh, or musical capability. I can't draw, He's can't paint, can't compose. Um, uh, however, I feel like uh, the scientific process entails uh, some creativity. And I have to say that some of the best ideas I've had for experiments have come when I've been listening to your music. And <laughs> I guess I just wanted to ask you um, if you had any thoughts about the relationship between art or music, what have you. Are you science. kidding? I think about it all the time, uh, especially uh, when it comes to science. As a kid, I was, uh, my hobby was science. So I was studying astronomy, I built a telescope, I did all that kind of stuff. I wasn't that good at mathematics. I was good at arithmetic, but not that good at mathematics, and I, I understood at a certain point that I was much better at music than I would be, ever be at science. But I had gotten a, a taste for science. I've written an opera about, new, about uh, Galileo. I have an opera about Einstein. I have an opera about Kepler. And someone asked me why I didn't do Newton. Well, the trouble with Newton was he never left his house, so nobody knows anything about Newton. <laughs> and I couldn't figure out how to write an opera about someone that no, who wouldn't talk to anybody. He was a real, he was a, a what do you call it? He was a recluse? More than that, he, he was a misanthrope. He didn't uh, like people. Yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, 
don't know. Oh, there's a funny. St- there may be so many funny stories about Newton. That maybe I could just tell the funny stories. <laughs> but uh, uh, so I got in, and, and now I'm working with Brian Green, who was a string theorist. Uh, I I did the score for a film uh, about Peter Haw- uh, uh, De- uh, Stephen Hawking called The Brief History of Time. So I got very interested in science. And one of the things, for example, I began to form the idea, now this, you might like this. I began to form the idea that, that's, that scientists were actually poets. And the re- I got that idea from something that Einstein said. In, one of, in the 1940s, right after he became very famous because of the bomb, of course, um, he began writing uh, uh, books about uh, relativity so that anybody could understand them, more or less you could understand them. There are a lot of, I was born in 37, so I knew a lot about those books. I, that's what I grew up with, reading those books. Um, but he describes one uh, moment. He said that he imagined, by this, uh, he was at that time a probably uh, uh, working in Bern, Switzerland, uh, 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 at the patent office, you know, looking at inventions. Did you know that he did that? You did know that. Uh, so he, uh, so again, he would, he would have to read these things and visualize how they worked, and figure out whether they were real or not. Mm-hmm. So he had, was in the habit of thinking. He must have been in the habit of thinking that. But in this book, he said that he imagined himself uh, sitting on a beam of light, and the beam of light was traveling across the universe like, at the speed of light. And he looked around, and he saw that. He was sitting still, and everything was rushing past him. And then he says this astonishing thing. He said, well, after that, all I had to do was figure out the mathematics to explain what I saw. <laughs> <laughs> Philip but, Glass. So, so by the idea, I got the idea that, 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 that uh, and then if I think about Dar- Darwin, if I think about Kepler, and you think, well, I know, I know about scientists. I read about them. I study them, and uh, I think of them as poets. Thank you for the questions, and thank you, thank, thank you, you, Philip Glass. <laughs>